happy to submit uh, to submit uh, questions via the chat, or you can raise your hand. Um, Eric, Val, Leanne, and I will be monitoring the uh, the chat uh, for questions, and we'll be posing those to the presenters today. Uh, today's session is on um, goal races um, and away races that you'd like to see on your bucket list. We're focusing on North America, both the East and West Coast. Um, oh, and um, as you'll see on the uh, pop-up screen there, this meeting is being recorded. This meeting is being recorded. Uh, so, um, uh, by remaining on the call, you're consenting to uh, having this meeting post uh, and any contributions you have to being posted on YouTube uh, on the Cora website. Um, and uh, if you don't agree with that, then um, you can remain silent and you will not appear on the recording. <laughs> That's probably the best thing. Or you can leave. Uh, but we don't really want you to leave. Okay. So, um, We've got uh, a number of East Coast uh, races, which people on the West Coast have probably never heard of before uh, on the agenda, and uh, as well as um, some, some well-known West Coast races as well. So on, on the East Coast, we've got, um, we'll have uh, Chris Hebert from Toronto talking about the Toronto International Outrigger Challenge. Uh, we've got Dave Kuntz from Hoiva'a. Um, he's from Philadelphia, but the race is actually in Atlantic City, New Jersey. Uh, we'll have Paula Amiglio uh, speaking about the Niche Pombo Paddle Fest in Miami, and uh, that and that's on the uh, East Coast. And then we've got Val Stepanchuk uh, speaking about the Gorge Outrigger Race down in Stevenson, Washington, on the Columbia River Gorge. Uh, we'll have Jeannie Law, who's raced the Alcatraz uh, from Vancouver Ocean Sports, uh, who's raced the Alcatraz race, and uh, I'll be speaking to my experiences on both the U.S. Uh, Iron Champs in San Diego and Catalina Crossing from Newport Beach to Catalina Island. Okay, so I'll hand it over to Val Simmons and uh, she'll uh, better introduce the uh, speakers and take it away. Thanks very much. Okay, uh, good evening everybody, thanks for coming. Um, so I'm gonna start with uh, Chris in Toronto. Are you ready, Chris, in Toronto? Uh, sure, okay. ready. Okay. And Chris, do you have pictures? Cause I have footage of the 2019 race. Uh, no, I mean, not with me. I, okay. I, there's there's someone on TIOC.ca. Okay, so um, I'm going to actually, if you don't mind, can I ask that Leanne Stanley <laughs> take over for two seconds because Val is having a hard time signing in and I want to help him out and I can't multitask. So Leanne, can you ask Chris about the Toronto race as if you've never been there before? <laughs> Leanne, hello. All right, okay. what are you asking me to do? <laughs> I I just I have to turn off my mic for two seconds because I need to help Val get into the meeting. So can you interview Chris about the Toronto race? And at sure. one point I'll come in and I'll share my screen so you guys could see footage of the Toronto race. Fantastic. Okay, thanks, right, Leanne. Chris, it's been Hi. a while. Nice yeah. to see you. It's been a while Good since I got to do the. The Toronto Island race. I remember back in the good old days, you know, a decade ago racing over there. So what is the format these days? Is it still a two day event? Yeah. Uh, well, so I'll talk about like normal TIOC, right? Like last year we, we, we had COVID TIOC, um, which yeah. I, I'm, I'm happy to talk about as well, but normal COVID yes, is two days. Um, the first day is mixed OC six and small boats. And then the second day, is uh, men's and women's OC6. Uh, it's a 17 to 20 kilometer race um, that goes around the Toronto Islands and back to TSCC. Uh, and afterwards we have a kind of a luau uh, award ceremony. The race has been around for uh, over 15 years now. Um, I took over as race director maybe, I don't know, eight years ago, something like that. Um, and uh, so it's got a great legacy, all kinds of uh, people. It, it's the race that everybody looks forward to uh, in Ontario and, and, and more so now uh, Quebec people as well. And we'd love to see even more coming from the West Coast. We had a, a few people from Cora come uh, in 2019. Uh, so that was great to see. I think that was Rob Burnell um, came down to visit. Yeah. And then, 
So we have about uh, 200 or so um, competitors over the weekend. Um, we'll have probably 10-ish um, OC6s on the water for the, for the six races and um, lots of OC1s, OC2s, uh, surf ski, sup, uh, kayak. And so with the men's and women's OC6 on the second day, that's Paul that's still making noise there. Eric, can you mute him? Uh, yeah, I'm just trying to find him in the list. Uh, I'm aware that it's him and I'm trying to mute him now. Okay. Thank you. Um, so the video that we're seeing right now is part of the OC6 stuff. Do the oh, cool. men and women go at the same time or do they start staggered or is it like a morning afternoon kind of thing? Yeah, no, they're two separate races. Uh, that way we can have as many OC6s as we have um, can be on the water at the same time. So, so uh, first... yeah, it'll, it, generally it'll be the women that go first uh, and they leave at something like eight in the morning, uh, come back at by 11, and then the, the men will hit the, the water at around 11, 1130 um, and go till mid-afternoon. So if people from the West Coast wanted to come and do this kind of race, um, how is easy is it to borrow small boats or get access to big boats? Like what might that process look like? Who do we have to sweet talk, you know, paying beer and wine and, you know, Okanagan cherries? We are very bribable. Um, big boats are usually no problem. We've never had a problem, uh, like had to turn people away in 2019. Uh, maybe we had to turn one team away, but, but generally speaking, we're pretty good with getting people six to sixes. Um, small boats are, are, you know, obviously more of a challenge, depends on who you know, and um, I've lent out my boat multiple times, um, but uh, it just depends on if you know somebody that, that has one, uh, we can ask around and put the word out, but uh, obviously uh, people that have a, a nice OC1 uh, might not want to lend it to somebody they don't know, but. And we get that. Yeah. Um, so for OC6s, if we're coming on the West, or people are coming up from the States, who is best to talk to? Is it straight to you guys as the race directors and then y'all kind of put feelers out or should we go to you know individual clubs that we see posted online? No, you can come directly to me. We organize that. Um, I've, I've usually got somebody delegated to have, uh, to be a boat person that, that organizes the, the boats. Um, and we've got a spreadsheet of all the teams and, and on the uh, sign up form, you can say whether you need a boat or, or have a boat. Um, and so for the people that need boats, we, we start to, figure out who's got boats and who needs boats. What's the race entry fee like? Is it a weekend fee or is it per race? Uh, there's both. So if you want to do one race, then there's the rate, single race and then there's the, the weekend rate, which drops the, uh, you get kind of a double day discount. Okay. Uh, I forget exactly what it is. I could look it up on the site, but it's, it's very reasonable. Well, I assume it changes year to year based on what you get for sponsorships and all that kind of stuff. Uh, it's, it's been pretty stable and pretty right. stable. Uh, sponsorships are more for the prizing. Um, full weekend is 90 bucks. One, one day is 60 bucks and two days is 90 bucks. Okay. Well, prizes, yeah. prizes. Oh yeah. Yeah. They have had, amazing uh, prizes. By Kobe sponsored us. Um, Kialoa. Uh, yeah, we've got usually maybe 10 sponsors. And there's usually food after from at least the last one I was at. That, yeah, that, that entry fee includes food, uh, includes a little giveaway. Yeah. And the other thing that is people may have seen these things online, but you folks have a high photographer that you, yep. that you hire for the event. So this photographer is great at catching, trying to catch everybody as they come past the CN Tower in the background. And these are beautiful shots. And if you haven't seen them, go on to the website for this race. And they are fantastic. The Toronto skyline is one of the most recognizable in the world. It is so cool to kind of see your picture in a boat in front of that. Yeah, it's a it's a great race. You know, if you haven't done it, um, it's it's neat. The back of the island. So you head out either you might head into the harbor first and then come out the back, or back first and then go into the harbor. It depends on the wind. Um, but either way, like when you're on the back of the island, it, the the city drops away and you feel like you're you're uh, you could be anywhere. And uh, the, the conditions will vary, you know, it's in September, so it could be anything from flat to six foot waves. Um, we had some good conditions on uh, in 2019 that were interesting. I think you saw, you might've seen some videos in there a few minutes ago. Um, 
but uh, you know, you've got the the island, which is nice, and then you're in the harbor and like some commercial traffic, and so that kind of throws the race around a little bit. Uh, and TSCC, a nice little, is a nice little club um, that uh, that uh, is great to you know host it there. And so, no, it's a it's a great race, and I really would love to see some more people from the West Coast, especially uh, joining us. For me, I always want to come back because it's my homecoming race. That was the first ever OC one race I ever did. Um, was the Toronto Island race. And for some people that are trying to think about what the water's like, as you go through the harbor, um, you have to go through a channel where there's a ferry going across to uh, the airport, which is right there, Little Island Airport. So you have to dodge that little ferry. Um, it's, pretty, it's pretty easy once you kind of figure out how long it's gonna stay and go through. There's, so there's a little bit of current in there. Then in the harbor, you said there's commercial traffic yeah. So there's lots of boats going through there. Sometimes there's ferries that go out to the island from the mainland as well. And then you have another channel to go out as you go past kind of the industrial area there. And there's another channel. And then on the outside of the island, you can get anything. This is the first yeah. place where I really ever had clean waves. And you could see the people in the video that Val showed at the beginning there, they were a little too close to shore on the outside of the island. <laughs> so they were getting caught in a little bit of the break because there is a break there it's all yeah. sandy and it's beautiful to play in when you know you're not trying to surf across it um you've got to watch there because if you get too close into shore it is very shallow and it can break on you and so yeah. depending on which way you choose to, the course is around the island it's either on the side or not on the side yeah yeah uh and then there's sometimes the new beach so you might get some uh, you you're... might get some uh, some special views uh, the, the nice thing about the commercial traffic is that we don't have to, I mean, you, you need to avoid it and you may, need to make sure you're not uh, running into any ferries, but we don't stop the race. Like, uh, you know, when you go to New York, uh, there's commercial traffic and they're bringing those red flags up every 10 minutes. It's like, oh my God, painful. Um, whereas we just keep going. So um, that's what I like about it. So the gist of it is that you want people to come. You'll help people find sixes if they want to come. You can get mixed race on Saturday, men's or women's on Sunday. So you can get a lot of bang out of your weekend. Yeah. Where's the best place to stay if we're coming down for a race there? Uh, I don't really know. Uh, I, I mean, personally, I would go to Airbnb um, and find something. But uh, I mean, it depends on are you a hotel you know? person or a or an Airbnb person, or do you know anybody where you could crash, crash with them? Um, right. Yeah. Cool. I really but if anybody them. has any questions, like I'm uh, easy to contact, blade at bell.net. Um, shoot me any questions along the way, or, uh, you know, currently we are, I'm assuming that we are going to have a race this year. I think by September, you know, we'll, we'll be vaccinated. Um, but last year, what happened is we didn't, uh, we had to cancel the race, but then we had an informal friends and family kind of race. And so it was, we had 65 people on the water, um, but everybody launched from different locations and, and very, you know, distanced, socially distanced and all, all that stuff. So it was very COVID safe, uh, but we had a great race and uh, people were just appreciative. I mean, at that point in September, that was, you know, uh, having been in, in the dark for, for months. So um, it was great to get back on the water and see everybody and, and have kind of a fun race. Afterwards, we didn't have the luau or the the uh, award ceremony. Everybody just uh, scrambled after that. So um, that's what we did. Thanks. Chris, do you mind putting in the website for the race and your contact message in the chat for everybody, just in case, yeah. so they have uh, that on record? And that'd be great. Yeah, we will do. Thanks. And uh, yeah. Val also mentioned that you might be able to speak to the Why Nui Why Not race in Oakville. Uh, do, do you know anything about that race? Oh, I can speak to it because uh, Wendy's not here, uh, for sure. Wendy's, uh, not, Wendy's not here. Okay, sure. Um, I don't know the date for it this year. Um, oh, speaking of dates, so the date for uh, TIOC is September 25th and 26th. So Wainui is another great uh, East Coast race. Um, I think usually it's in early August. Um, and uh, another great long legacy race. Wendy's been having it for uh, years and years and years and years. Um, most famous for the awards they give out, uh, are, are cookies, you know, so you get a gold cookie or a silver cookie or a bronze cookie. Um, and so, um, uh, those are the two big races in this area is the TIOC and Wainui. Um, 
and and we we spread them out so they're not overlapping and and there's there's uh, some distance in between them um it's usually about between 12 and 15 kilometer distance um and it's from uh Cothra, which is over in sort of a little west of Mississauga, or actually in Mississauga, um, which is just uh, west of Toronto. And they normally do kind of a go out and do a triangle and come back. So it's a great race. Yeah. Again, I they get a the pretty same... good turnout um, yeah. there as well. Um, the small boat portion of it has really been growing the past few years as more and more people are getting small boats. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's a triangle and they try and Fit the triangle with whatever the conditions are doing that day so that you do get a bit of a downwind run um, is what they try to do as well. Yeah, exactly. What's going to be interesting is to see what happens now. So uh, we just got uh, 60 OC1s landed uh, about a month and a half ago. I, I got one of them, um, but it's going to be interesting to see how many of those end up racing. So looking forward to it. I've done both Wainui and Toronto quite a few times now, and I can say that the thing about both those races is if you think that you're going to know the water conditions you don't <laughs> the race will start with one water condition and it'll end with another and even if you check the weather it doesn't matter when you get to the race that's when you know what the water conditions are it's crazy that that's coming off of a lake um, in 2019 at tscc the water was flat uh, and I, I took the motorboat out uh, first thing in the morning to, to set the course. And by the time I got out, uh, you know, maybe two, three kilometers offshore, the boat is up and down. Like, and it's funny that exact same condition was today. So there's a real east wind. Uh, and I, I got there this morning and, and again, it was flat and you can barely feel the wind. And then we got out uh, to the island and uh, it was probably about four or five foot waves today. And we just uh, surfed Karosi ones from the, from the island all the way to Humber Bridge. It was a beautiful morning. Crazy. Okay, well, thanks, Chris. So guys, just so that you know, any information, um, we're going to post it all to the website after, but some of it's going on in the chat. I think the next one, I'm going to ask um, Dave Kunz from Philadelphia to talk about his race, the Hovaha, which actually takes place in Atlantic City. So uh, Dave, are you there? Dave! So tell us a little bit about what it, the, the race experience is, when it is, because I think the date is a little bit different this year, but I'm not sure. Um, give us a little bit of the rundown. Yeah, as soon as I can figure out how to share my screen, why don't I run a, a, a couple minute um, video of the race and I can tell you uh, the short of it and then uh, open up for questions. How does that sound? That sounds great. Let's see, shared screen. Go. All right, so um, Hoi Va'a has been going on for about 10 years. Uh, it's an open ocean race from the beach. Uh, it's out of Atlantic City and Brigantine. <clears throat> this year we went back to the original date of uh, September, so it's an end of the season race for us, September 11th and 12th, uh, where surprisingly the water is still warm in Atlantic City. Uh, every year we have approximately 30 to 35 crews. Uh, it's a two day event. Saturday is the Waterman's Challenge, which is a nine mile race in OC1, OC2, kayaks, SUPs. Sunday is the OC6 race. Uh, again, we have about 30 to 35 crews. Uh, we have at least 15 OC6s every year on the beach for the race. Uh, so the format <clears throat> is we have a women's race, a men's race, a mixed race, and then we have a short race. Uh, the, the women's, men's, and mixed are between 9 to 12 miles, depending on conditions. Uh, it's a triangle race. We, we shifted that a couple of years ago. So <clears throat> the first couple of miles, we go straight out into the ocean from, from an inlet. The inlet is between uh, Atlantic City and Brigantine. Uh, and then because the, the, both the wind and the, um, and the surf comes typically from the southeast, we then run the course northwest. So you get a part of a triangle that's downwind. And then you come back along the shoreline back to the uh, to the start. So it's the women's race. Well, the first race we do is a short race, which is about three to four miles. The idea being, we opened this up a couple of years ago, 
<clears throat> we wanted to make it available for just about anyone who wanted to race, regardless of how much experience they had or what shape they're in. Uh, so the, the three to four mile sort of beginner race has been really popular. Um, and then we have the women's race, then the men's race, then the mixed race. Uh, the mixed is, is the most popular race because that's when the, the conditions get the craziest. Um, let's see, we have OC6 canoes available for out of town teams. Uh, we've always had many out of town teams come and we've never had a problem uh, getting anyone a canoe. Uh, we always have a luau after the race as well. This year, the luau issue is, is up in the air because we just don't know where we're gonna be with COVID. Uh, we wanna have a luau. We'll, we'll, update everyone when we when we know for sure. So that's that's the, the short of it. Any uh, questions? This is the men's yes. race from 2016. Um, okay, so I asked you this before, but now that everybody's in, I'll ask you, if people are traveling, is it possible to get uh, an OC6 from you guys? Or how easy is it to try to get a canoe to race in? Every year we, we lend out lots of uh, OC6s and I've never had a, an issue uh, getting a team in OC6 who needed it. Okay, and what about, I mean, I'm, I'm assuming if it's Atlantic City, there's lots of places to stay, but you guys have recommendations, like as organizers, do you recommend where crews can stay? I mean, we don't even yeah. know if the border is going to be open this year, but, you know, <laughs> we can pray. Yeah. So if it is, where do Canadians stay when they go down there? Yeah, there, there, there are a plethora of hotels and, uh, and uh, places you can rent. Uh, we have blocked rooms in the past, but people tend to just uh, figure out where they're going to go on their own. Okay. So there, there's plenty of plenty of places. Uh, Dave, uh, this is Eric. I just have a question about water conditions. Like, uh, uh, you know, that's a pretty mild looking day, but when it gets rougher, do you guys skirt your boats? Because I noticed they're all unskirted. Maybe if you could just talk about the range of conditions that you can anticipate on that race. Yeah, I mean, uh, it goes everything from relatively flat to uh, one, what the police lost their boat one year because it, it, uh, the conditions were so bad. Um, so, and, and and there was one year we had to call it because the uh, the safety boats would not go in the water. So, <laughs> you know, it, occasionally it, get, it gets so bad that that even the the, the safety motor boats won't go in. But that's that that was a unique year. But uh, it's typically an exciting race. Dave, didn't you because the the conditions were bad outside? You went inside, right? What you did an inside yeah. course? Yes, we did that exactly. So we do have, you know, if, if to the to the right of the screen is is the ocean, to the left of the screen is is a rather large bay. So um, uh, we can go into the bay if if we have problems. And one year we even had lightning nearby, not dangerously nearby, but close enough that we decided to make it. Instead of one large triangle, we made it two small triangles, so that we could keep everyone closer to the end if if the lightning got got closer, so we could call it. And actually, that was a really good race because. Uh, I think everybody saw each other. It wasn't, you know, some of the races you jump in, the people ahead of you disappear, the people behind you disappear, and you're paddling by yourself for an hour. Uh, it's not the same as when you're constantly turning in a, in, a, in a triangle and you get to see the people ahead and behind you. So uh, that was that was the actually the closest times we've ever had. Yeah, there's there's one race locally in BC where there's a double triangle, and one year they they had it so that instead of going around the triangle the same direction twice. Uh, one try one buoy was a 360 degree turn um, so you doubled back and you went opposite everybody else coming the other way so you got to see everybody on the way back so that was really cool there our is club a has done your race a few times Dave but uh, we love it love it there is a question in the chat. I think it's for your race. I can't imagine it being for TIOC, but uh, Lewis would like to know, is there an unlimited class or is it all spec or do you just put all the boats in regardless of what kind of boat they are? That's a great question. You know, we, 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 we are, had a discussion at, at the board of Philadelphia Outdoor for years, whether or not to buy an, out, uh, an unlimited and whether or not to make an unlimited class. And then uh, we bought it unlimited uh, I got my way on that one. <laughs> Finally won the argument. And soon after, uh, four other clubs bought uh, unlimited. So we now have an unlimited class. So I expect uh, at least four or five boats in the unlimited class this year. 
Okay. And typically, how long does it take to do this race? Uh, it's a good two hours. Okay. So it's a it's a typical iron OC. Yes. Great. Okay. And can you put in the chat um, how we can uh, contact you or or what the website is for the race? And um, we'll also put that on the Cora website. And if anybody else has questions, um, you can add them to the chat and we'll continue to ask Dave if he stays in on the call because we know it's a holiday weekend. Um, I'm just getting, that's great. Okay, thanks Dave. You know we're coming, how Nanny's coming down, you know. I just don't know if it'll be this year. It depends if the border's opened or not, but we'll be coming down. Okay, so I'm just waiting two seconds for Paolo to come back in. Paolo, are you in? <laughs> we can talk about him while he's not here yeah okay i'm going to share my screen again um paulo's going to come in to talk about um the niche pombo race down in miami it's put on by the canna um club which is a beautiful club in uh, miami florida um again i'm just going to share my screen real quick it's a two-day event um there's both uh, OC6 on one day and then the small boats on the next day. Val, you have a question? I was just wondering if I could, um, if you could put me in before Paula, because I have to uh, run to the airport here in a minute. <laughs> oh, okay. So that's what I'll do then. You know what? Instead of niche, we'll go to Val and we'll talk about the gorge. Um, yes. I'll, I'll stop sharing my screen then, Val. Okay, so Val Stepanchuk, thank you for joining us. And you know a lot about the gorge because you're living up there now. So what's, so what's so great about the gorge that everybody keeps telling me this has to be on your bucket list, you have to do the gorge. And why well, is it- the gorge is- uh, Why is it so much better uh, of a downwind race than the Hawaii downwind races? <laughs> Uh, one of the reasons that I moved out here um, is I wanted to kind of experience this for the for uh, being out here for full time and I've been out here for two years now. Um, but the cool thing about the gorge is uh, you are racing on uh, on the freshwater versus saltwater, which I don't think that's that's the cool thing, but um, the beauty of it is that it's consistently windy. like it consistently can be 20 to 30 knots uh almost any day of the summer so uh like right now today like this weekend we have a little bit of a lull where we have the wet uh winds coming from the east uh not as much waves on the river but within the next few days it's going to shift over completely and we have west wind coming in and perfect downwind conditions uh, I always thought of the gorge as like the gorge teach the river if you come out pilot the gorge it teaches you how to do downwind uh, on you know surf ski or outrigger. There are some conditions that can get pretty gnarly where uh, there's some parts of the river that get gnarly, but uh, there are always parts of the river where anybody can go out and uh, train on, whether you're a beginner uh, to a downwind conditions or you're an expert uh, and you know how to do how to do nice downwind runs. Another thing is uh, the river runs east to west and the wind typically blows in the summertime west to east so it creates um it creates waves on the river um and which makes it really exciting to connect so you're not really going that fast unless you're connecting waves um and there are times where uh if you're not connecting waves you're going really slow or you could be even going backwards <laughs> uh because of the current uh so the gorge is uh i mean it's it's different from um, like paddling in Hawaii and it's paddling like anywhere else, uh, just because you're between two states, Oregon and Washington, and you're in this beautiful, surrounded by beautiful mountains, you're going up the river uh, for the most part. And the, 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 I'm in Cascade Locks and typically our finish for the downwind champs is in Hood River, which is a 20 mile run uh, on the good, on the good windy day you can do it around 
in this 20 mile run in about two hours. So averaging about 10 miles an hour, which is pretty incredible, like when you're constantly flying. Um, so it's exciting time. And it's also became one of the largest races, I would say, OC and uh, small boat and uh, uh, surf ski races, I would say in North America, as far as I know. Um, because in 2019, we had um, over 200, I want to say close to 200 OC1s and uh, close to, I, I want to say close to 300 something uh, surf skis on the starting line. And there were also stand up paddlers as well as uh, a two person craft that had um, different start times. So there are typically four different starts. The uh, first one would be for a stand up paddlers, then the double ski and double outrigger then surf skis and the oc ones would start last at least it's how, how it's been in the past um, another cool thing about paddling in the gorge is uh, um, carter um, has put on the vortex series so we've had in the um in the past few years we've had smaller races series where we do uh, just a one day event um and uh the Vortex series, we just had the first one, you know, it was kind of surreal having the first race in over a year. Um, and we had over 70 people that um, were at the starting line with different crafts. It was Stevenson to Home Valley, just a pretty mellow run, but the wind was on and it was super fun. Um, and uh, the next race is tomorrow. We're not supposed to have too much wind. Uh, but it's still going to be good. We're going to turn it, probably turn it into a um, a single loop in front of Hood River waterfront. So it'll be a big, probably six to eight mile loop um, where everybody starts in the same place and finishes back because of lack of wind. And the, the reason the downwind champs is set up in the format of six days is so people can come out and do runs through the week practice for the first couple of days and then we set up the time of the race based on the conditions so let's say a uh, window between wednesday and saturday the windiest day of the week is when the race is going to happen it kind of in a nutshell kind of tells you on just a little bit about the race i think so the logistics again if somebody's going to do the gorge for the first time is it difficult to get a canoe do you have to bring your own or is it easy to get one there for the most part i would say people tried to bring their own um a different um like kaiva and so is puakea they they bring some boats they have some demo boats that are available to rent out um but you would have to reach out directly to those companies to uh find a canoe there are, there's not that many canoes, I would say, available, but still uh, there are ways around because there's a ton of teams from Southern California that come up. Um, so if somebody needs an extra boat, uh, if if you contact them in advance, you could reserve, uh, you could get a canoe from that. But in the gorge, there's not that many. Um, I would say it's a little harder to find a canoe versus a surf ski just from my personal experience but it's doable like so if somebody really wants to do it it's definitely possible to arrange it um another thing i would say um that coming out to for the gorge downwind champs it's it's not just a race i think it's an event like where people a lot of people that i know that come out don't come out specifically to race but they just come to be part of it like they come out to participate in the downwind runs and the race is just kind of an icing on the cake. Um, and uh, um, so it's, it's an experience of being, uh, being able to, you know, do runs down the river. I remember my vividly remember my first round uh, at the gorge. We, I came out for a six man race. Although this, this year, we're not going to have the six man race. Um, um, and the year that we came out, uh, the six man, there was no wind on the race on the day of the six man race. As a matter of fact, the wind was coming the opposite direction and it was 95 degrees. And uh, we did like, 
I think it was a 12 mile loop and we had to do three laps in front of Stevenson. It was brutal. There was one guy that had a heat exhaustion, had to go to the hospital in one of the boats that were participating, which is crazy enough. Uh, but the next day it was windy <laughs> and we took our, um, we had a pink canoe that year. I remember taking that canoe uh, from Cascade Locks to Hood River and it was like one of those iconic moments that from then on, it seemed like the gorge just became a destination place. So um, I guess that's sort of the nature of our sport eight. We just never know what the water conditions are gonna be and that's what uh, makes it so fun and exciting. But when you're describing how many canoes can be on the river, I'm just curious because you also said there's all different levels. Is there a lot of crashes? <laughs> Because it, you know, if you have all different levels in any sport, um, it doesn't always go well. Right. I, I wouldn't say that. The, I mean, the gorge race is definitely not for like a, somebody that just started doing downwind because and, and Carter really adamant at enforcing that part. You know, if you're not able to in those conditions, if you're not able to get back in, you know, if you hooli and you can't get back in the boat right away or you can't stay with the boat. Um, you know, like Carter's philosophy, we're going to rescue you, your boat, call it totaled. You know, we're not going to save your boat. It's simply for the safety part of the race. So um, the, the reason I'm saying that um, it's an event for a lot of people, because coming out, you know, they're, um, they try to make the race go through like the best part of the river. Like there's, there are parts of the river that are um that the wind that the waves can get much bigger i mean you can always hug the shoreline and get away from the bigger waves and try to stay um away from the conditions but i think uh when you when you're going out and participating in this event you want to get the best run possible um on the course um so i think coming out for the first time i always recommend for people to just whether you know come out early and kind of anticipate to you know experience the gorge first um before you uh you know you go out in the gnarliest conditions so we had um i think last event in 2019 we had probably 150 people drop out because of the conditions because it was so windy i mean obviously we picked the best day to participate but it was so windy that there were some people that were not uh, ready to take on those conditions. But would you recommend maybe that um, people come and try um, paddling on the gorge before the race with some kind of guide, you know, like a guy like you or something, um, who's going to sort of show us a little bit of the ropes before we get into a race situation on the gorge? Like, are there people available to do that? Absolutely. I mean, as I think for, for myself, it's one of the reasons that I came out here is to be able to, um, you know, we have, I'm trying to set up a little bit of a, a club part to where we have a shared equipment in Cascade Locks. We don't have too many canoes. I do have uh, a few OC1s and some surf skis. Um, but the idea is to be able to um, get people out on the water um, to participate in different water sports. We're trying to develop a junior program also. Uh, to get kids on the water. Last summer we had, um, um, during the shutdown, we were, I think we were the, like one of the only ones that had um, actually kids out on the water participating in water sports. Like in Hood River, they still had, um, even this year, uh, they opted out in doing the kids programs um, and just doing the adult, uh, even in the six man canoes. Um, they just started practicing in the six man uh, boats. Uh, but we we were small enough to where we were okay with like getting uh, younger kids on the water. But yeah, there's definitely um, between the local knowledge people that go out on the river, um, it's definitely uh, possible to organize a group for people to get comfortable being on the river and also tell you on, uh, and I would love to help out with anything I can for people to come out to paddle out here. That's fantastic. And I see that Leanne's writing that the week of the gorge, there's all kinds of um, uh, clinic, OC clinics by some uh, top coaches and paddlers. So that sounds fantastic. 
from what I hear, when you go to the gorge, you don't stay in an Airbnb, you stay in a tent in the woods. Is that true? Uh, that's one of the options. I think it's the easiest, typically the easiest option, because uh, especially this year, we moved from uh, hosting from Home Valley to uh, Hood River. So like typically everything was organized in Hood River um, and people stayed in Viento or in Stevenson. But this year for downwind champs, the base is in Stevenson. So we have literally all of the Stevenson fairgrounds and camping is really inexpensive for those that would like to do it. But there are plenty of Airbnbs. Uh, there are hotels that are also available. Um, um, and I mean, I, in the past few years, I've had, uh, my uncle had a um, has a you know a place that I've originally I came out and I thought I would you know set up an Airbnb but we decided to kind of opt out of that and but we've had over the summer we've always had people um, just crash on the we had bunk beds and couches or floor space or even tent in the backyard uh, so it's like there's definitely a way to like make it work um, but it's just up to you on what you can do you can have um, a world-class resort like Skamania uh, Lodge is like super nice five-star resort I would say that's just up from uh, fairgrounds you could be camping or you could be staying in a nice uh, resort place so there's opportunities with that it just uh, the cost is you know effective. and typically the date of the event is usually when Um, so typically middle of July. So like this year, it's, uh, the dates are scheduled July 12th through 17th. That's the, uh, that's the date for the Downwind Champs. Okay. And we'll post um, the website link to Cora. If there's any other information that you can put in the chat, Val, that would be appreciated. Um, uh, one, one question. Do you, know did, what the, uh, do you know what the status sorry. of the OC6 race is? Currently, um, I've spoke with JD. I hope to unload uh, a container a uh, weeks ago, and uh, we have officially can't, unfortunately. Um, but okay. that's kind of season. But um, the six man race has been canceled. Okay. And also for information on Downwind Champs, Carter's website, uh, Gorge downwindchamps.com um, if you log in there there's really thorough information about lodging and places just around Hood River and uh, also places to see uh, places to eat uh, things to do outside of paddling <laughs> um, and also if if at any point if anybody wants to reach out you're coming out and you need suggestions like how to get it how to um, surf the stern wheeler <laughs> seems to be my calling these days <laughs> uh but you know like i know the captain and like the times that are going out and it's it's kind of a fun event you know when everybody comes out to the gorge you know that's one of the things to do <laughs> on the hot summer day when there's no wind you know you can still find a wave awesome so uh last question val when are you going to cut your beard <laughs> i thought this was okay in canada no no it's cool i'm just i'm, I'm just bugging you it's the, the covid look uh no you look great you always look great pal um thank you so much for coming in and answering questions I, if you're gonna stick around that's great but i know you have to fly somewhere so um if other people have questions they can put them in the chat and we'll try to either answer them or send them off to you but it's good to see you val yeah, and don't hesitate reaching out to me uh, or, um, you know, I would love to help out with anything that I can out here um, in the gorge, you know, if you're, so if you're coming out, you know, like I have some boats and maybe not the best boats, <laughs> but I'm willing to share and make it work. That's fantastic. Cool. Thanks, Val. Okay, so next... Paolo, are you on the call? I think I see you, but can we um, can we see if your sound is a little bit better? Yeah, how's that? Hey, that's fantastic, Paolo. Okay, everybody, this is Paolo from uh, 
Miami. He um, He's with Canada Louis, but he does stuff outside of that as well. And he's going to talk about Niche. Paolo, I have a couple of photos from Niche, but why don't you take it away and um, I'll show some photos later. Um, all right. So in a nutshell, Niche is a two-day event. Uh, first day is going to be six fans. Second day is going to be small craft. So um, we tend to run the race depending on conditions. So usually when you see it on Paddle Guru, you will not see like everybody. It, it's like constant. What's the race course? What's the race course? The race course isn't usually decided until the week of the race. Um, this year, they're looking at maybe doing it um, Oceanside. So actually doing a point to point race. Um, if the logistics of it can be worked out, that'll be awesome. Um, but like I said, we always look at the conditions, uh, two years ago, we had some pretty gnarly conditions. Um, <laughs> one of Val's girls got a hook in her face. I remember that pretty well. Um, and then, uh, the year before that it was flat. So on the flat years, we tend to do a longer race closer to 14 miles on the windy years. We tend to close it up and, you know, usually run about eight to eight to 10 miles. And uh, there's some good footage of the uh, <laughs> two men uh, on the second day on Sunday, we usually run all the small boats. And again, depending on conditions, we try to find a race course that'll give you some downwind. So those, those pictures bring back a lot of, a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, smiles to me. I guess I should, since you brought up the hook, I guess I should show that, huh? <laughs> yeah, so that was rather um, a scary story. When, yeah, she, uh, pa passing under one of the bridges, she, uh, one of the fishermen got her in the, in the lip and we um, took a pair of pliers, cut the barb off the hook and pulled it out. Yeah. That's that's the, the short version of the story. So Paulo, what's it like getting canoes down there for people that are coming from the state? Six six man canoes are, are pretty easy. Um uh the with the growth in canoes here in, in Florida, we kind of rely on all the clubs. Everybody brings canoes down. Um so there is a rental program for out of state and out, you know. Uh, international crews and stuff so we really haven't had an issue getting canoes for everybody um and then for the uh for the one man you know small craft that can be a little more challenging i try to help out with as many canoes as i can um i also uh try to you know get surf skis and stand up boards for people um but that can be more challenging if you're really like really hard set on on paddling the small boats you probably you know to, to I like absolutely have a guarantee you need to get on it early um and then uh you know or bring your own which i know from from your neck of the woods that's gonna that's tougher to do i usually sit out the race so that people can use my canoes so um you know that just kind of tells you the availability of boats so guys, the, the location of this race is really beautiful. It's right by Key Biscayne in Miami, and Miami is a happening town. So if you go down there for the race, there's all kinds of um, other stuff to do because, I mean, it's it's a city and with beaches and great water and great nightlife and stuff. Um, so we went down and we really had a, a great time at this race. We stayed for a few days um, and they do have, uh, for those that are interested, um, they race two divisions. They do the uh, unlimiteds and the spec divisions. There's enough canoes to get that going. But I do imagine that if it gets too popular, you probably won't be able to fulfill all the people that would want to do the race um, if they get down there. So, uh, yeah. Well, you, yeah, usually the hard part is that a lot of times, obviously, a lot of the visiting clubs are like, oh, we want to race unlimiteds. And, and that's the hardest boat to get. Um, so, you know, come with an open mind and, and just, you know, 
if if you're expecting an unlimited, that might be harder. Um, kind of Louis owns six canoes, um, and only one of them's an unlimited. And you know, there's more of them coming, but it takes you know, again, you're you're more likely to be racing in a spec boat than in an unlimited. So, Paolo, I know that the year that we were down there in 2019, the water conditions were a little bit more crazy than usual. I mean, there were canoes that had way more ocean experience than us doing donuts. Um, but normally, what kind of experience do you need to be able to do this race? Um, you know, I would say, obviously, even a novice crew can come down here. Um, what we had the last time was exceptional. We do get, I mean, it is the beginning of our downwind season. Um, you know, right it right in November is the beginning, is right when the wind starts to kick up. People don't realize Miami is is as windy as it is. We have, you know, US Olympic sailing center here. People come down here from all over the world for sailing. So um it does kick up. Um, not usually to that extent. You know, you might get 20 mile an hour winds on a on a race but um you know again because we have to run all the races typically on one day the courses that we do we we, we don't tend to throw you out into the into the open bay where it's going to be a little bit you know uh maybe perhaps uh, over someone's uh skill level um and we have a bunch of we always have boats patrolling and you know if we if we see somebody get in trouble, you're gonna you, you're gonna get help. Still with you? Yeah. Okay, and then uh, just really brief, Paolo, only because you're in the same neck of the woods. I know it's not your race, but you know a little bit about the Clearwater race. Can you just sort of mention and how far are they apart? They're no. It's not like we can go down for both races, right? They're not one week after the other. No, they're usually about a month apart. Um, so Clearwater is a, it's a, it's a good event. It's smaller. Um, they do as well run two days. Uh, sometimes depending, you know, they've changed their format, uh, but, uh, they, they run a really good race. Um, typically they go out the, uh, Clearwater Inlet and they'll adjust their course for weather conditions. Um, Lex Ross is usually the one that sets up the course and he's, he's a, he's a very good waterman. So, um, same kind of thing like Miami we do, they do, uh, big boats the first day, little boats the second day. Um, and you know, it's usually an eight to nine mile race. Same for the, for the small boats. Um, conditions tend to not be as challenging as Miami. Um, you know, uh, but they do get a nice upwind downwind sometimes. So it, it like I said, it, it's a it's a nice race. Um, you know, uh, they do a good job. That's uh, usually put on by Ozone Florida. So they, they that's who you'd want to like contact for like when they're going to do it because obviously with COVID they canceled last year and they they, they every year they got to kind of adjust their dates with you know Clearwater Beach is such a popular place that I think when they they adjust their dates by a little bit, uh, depending on permitting and stuff. But it is a good race, and Clearwater is a nice place to go. It's a little bit more laid back, a little quieter than than down here. Um, so you know, it's a it's a fun thing. Um, you know, are you Miami, guys planning to do um, the Miami race this year? Yeah, right now it's on the books. It's going to be the first weekend in November. Um, I think it's already up on Paddle Guru. And, you know, we'll follow the similar format. So we'll have the race on Saturday. We'll have music, you know, all the, all the food and, you know, the, the live, the live band and everything and everybody gets to hang out. Um, the details for Friday evening, usually Friday evening, we do some sort of talk story thing. I don't know uh, exactly what the plan is yet. Some of, some of the things are still being obviously planned out because um, the city's very slow to kind of give permission for all of this, but, I think as 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 COVID's getting a little more under control down here, we'll get more details out for the race. But I don't really see a reason why the race wouldn't happen this year. Okay, but you, but you were you're not sure if Johnny and all of his posse are going to be down there. Um, 
I don't know again. Yeah, because we're still, everyone's still kind of making travel arrangements and figuring out schedules and all that kind of stuff. So um, typically we do run some clinics, uh, you know, starting on Wednesday. So it's like Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and then the race is Saturday. But as of right now, I don't have that, that information yet. Like none of that's confirmed. Okay. Okay. Well, thanks. I'm going to have to move on because I'm realizing the time and we have three yep. other races to go over, but thank you so much, Paolo. And guys, I've done, well, I didn't race niche. I had a broken wing, um, but my crew was down there and I was down there with them and we really had a good time. So if you're looking for a Florida race, especially Eastern people, I know there's mostly Western people in the call, but it's a little bit cheaper for us to fly down to Florida than it is for us to fly across the country to, um, Victoria or Vancouver for a race. <laughs> so um, it, it, it's a good time. So I, uh, I really recommend it. And Paolo, um, registration for this race is on Paddle Guru, which a lot of American races are. I'm not sure if yep. everybody is familiar with that, but we'll put all that information on the website. Yeah, they can also email Vince and Christian directly as well, you know, because if you're coming from out of country, we can, you know, they'll work with you directly um, to, to make it easier. Okay, so I'll put their information up on our website. So mm -hmm. thank you so much. Yeah, definitely. Mahalo. Definitely. Hey, take it easy, guys. Thanks. Okay, right. I'm going to turn it over to Ron. Um, and Ron can also speak with, uh, can ask Jeannie some questions on Alcatraz. I don't know which order you want to do this in, Ron, but I'm going to turn the mic over to you now. Okay, um, yeah, so we're switching over back to the West Coast again, and we've got Jeannie Law from uh, Vancouver Ocean Sports. She's done the Alcatraz ar ar around the rock, I think it's called, uh, in San Francisco a couple of times, and uh, she can speak to that, give her impressions on it, some of the, maybe some logistics and that sort of thing. So uh, Jeannie, if you can uh, give us, talk about your experience there. I have done the Al Round the Rock race uh, twice. First time was in 2010, and I did the long course as a woman's crew. I was probably a one year, maybe two year OCR at that point, so it was terrifying. <laughs> um, my advice to any crew that is thinking of doing this race is if you're coming from the West Coast, especially BC, you're leaving Vancouver in August, most likely in a heat wave and landing in October weather. Uh, we literally landed and went to the closest sports store and bought, I bought boots and a sweater. It was so cool. Uh, this, I did it again in 2017, the race, this time as a short course, cause we had a bit of a novice crew that I was going with and I was better prepared. Unfortunately, we had other issues that trip. Um, the first year, the first trip down, we, our Vancouver Ocean Sports brought down seven crews. Three women, two men, and one, uh, sorry, uh, two uh, novice. Um, they changed the short course in, in the meantime, as when I did it again in 2017, we did the short course and we launched from the shore versus underneath the Golden Gate Bridge. The first year, our novice crews didn't actually come anywhere near Alcatraz. They uh, basically did figure eights in the bay before Alcatraz. Um, 2017, when I did it, we launched from the shore, went around Alcatraz, and then came back to the beach. Short course is about eight kilometers. And long course is about 16, 18, depending what they decide they're going to do. Um, we actually started our race in 2010, pretty much almost underneath the Golden Gate Bridge, and then went on one side of Alcatraz to, I believe it's the Bay Bridge, and then came back along the shoreline to Cressy Field, which is where which is the race site. Um, prepare for cold. Getting a loaner boat for 2017 was actually not hard at all. Um, the host club coordinates it all. The only issue we had was we were hoping to rig and get the boat ready the Friday night, 
since we were the first race on Saturday and that did not happen. The boat didn't arrive and we end up rigging the boat. Uh, Ama onto Aku's, Aku's onto the boat, skirting it, do the huli court, the whole shebang, Saturday morning before the race. I was actually clipping the skirts, some of the skirts pieces together as we were putting the boat into the water. I would not advise that for anybody <laughs> going in um, to any race, uh, but it was an experience and I was wired by the time I got in the boat. Um, it, was a, it was a good testament of Ohana because you had six women who, as I said, was a pretty novice crew having to rig a boat pretty much for the first time on our own. Um, but the host clubs and all the other clubs, they came and helped us. They helped us move the boat to the water. Um, I would have never gotten the boat ready in time if it wasn't for the other crews and the other paddlers. Um, that's pretty much all I have. Any questions? Um. What were the conditions like? Did like I, I know that the long course used to go underneath the Golden Gate Bridge because uh, False Creek Mixed Distance did that one time, um, but I understand that uh, it doesn't anymore. But we started on the Alcatraz side of the bridge. It, they wouldn't let us underneath the bridge. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Because I think that I can't remember what year Mixed Distance did it, but uh, apparently there was also a cutoff or something that you know if you if you didn't make it through by this particular time, they would divert people away from that area because it was so rough yeah but um it's challenging water because it's cold and the other thing is then when you come out of the shadow of alcatraz you're hitting you're getting a spot where two currents are hitting at the same time so it gets mm -hmm. it's standing waves it's not anything you can really surf but it, it's mm -hmm. it's washing machine and oh yeah okay i remember 2017 race, uh, one of the girls, she was my seat for uh, not a ton of international OC racing and, or any sort of, like she's done all the locals, but that's about it. And she's like, she calls for a push. And I looked at her and went, for what? <laughs> I said, you're not gonna get anything here, right? But she just saw waves and went, okay, and I'm like, no, you're not getting, you're just going to go bouncing up and down. Um, it's cold conditions, uh, depending on the weather, depending on the wind, it can be on the side. Um, the Huli cord didn't come into hand on the either race, but I have heard from others that it has. Mm -hmm. We locked out the conditions weren't crazy on either race. Um, actually, the men's actually had crazier in 2010. There, they were, it's that sensation of when you're watching the boats and they disappear behind a wave and you can't see them at all. Oh, okay, so yeah. It was one of those cases and uh, seeing the, some somebody had been taking pictures and our seat one's completely submerged underwater. But being the women, they do it similar to us. It's short course, women's, and then men's mixed. Okay. So, uh, so, the men's so in order, definitely get a crazier. So run. the mixed run with the mixed run with the men in that race. I, I believe know for, it's like every other race organizer. I think that gets decided. Yeah. A, depending that, on how many boats things. I know that can, Scora Scora runs the mixed with the women, and then the men yeah. run on their own. Yeah. I honestly cannot remember. Um, I know the men's were separate from us, but we were right. doing strictly gender-based in 2010. Right. So okay, cool. and then the short courses, everybody. So 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 big big chop washing machine, but it's still an experience because you're in San Francisco Bay near when the Golden Gate Bridge. Get that close to Alcatraz. Well, you were near the Bay Bridge near Chrissy Field and I guess the Presidio and that, so. Right, like it's, the 2010 when we did it, 
I couldn't see Alcatraz when we were at the start line. It was this vague smudge in the clouds. Yeah. And there's so, probably a lot of fog too. That's why it would, would have been cold, right? Yeah. yeah. So it was, uh, we, it's, you had a general direction that you could see. Like I said, it was, you could see the smudge of the island, but that was about it. It wasn't until we got closer that we had an idea of which, which way we had to aim to get to go around the island properly. Were there buoys you had to aim for that you couldn't swap, couldn't find? <laughs> um, no, but you were probably about a kilometer or less away from the island before you actually could really get a good look at it. Yeah, okay. So it's, it's interesting paddling toward something that you can't see. Um, that's like a lot of a lot of races are like that though. Like uh, even in BC, like Vernon's Freshwater Challenge. If you've ever, ever done that chain race, you're heading down Okanagan Lake looking for this little orange ball that <laughs> you cannot find. Anyways, so sorry. <laughs> or, uh, or I had a similar experience of that in still in the desert. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, the, I can't remember the, the the tank tank. It's a little propane tank that's floating over there. Yeah, that's right. Or the or the pumpkin. Yeah. It's. I think it was the pumpkin. And the thing is, it was first time we had launched, or at that point, the unlimited that we had. But it's not an unlimited anymore. Uh, and we end up in the front of the pack. And I'm so used to just following the path. Right. And it yeah. was like, where's my mark? Oh my God, where's my mark? <laughs> yeah, um, that, that's but, uh, the value of steers meetings, I guess, or whatnot. No, so. I went. I, I'm one of these ones that will go, and I definitely <laughs> okay. did it in San Francisco because, yeah, because of the fog, you had to have some idea of where you were heading. Okay, cool. Thank God well, for chase boats. Well, that's right. Yeah. Okay. Thanks a lot. Uh, no I guess we'll move on. Thanks a lot. We'll uh, move on to the couple of Southern California races. I'll, I'll speak to these ones because I've, I've done them a couple of times. Um, so in Southern California, the um, Outrigger Racing Association is SCORA, Southern California Outrigger Racing Association. And unlike um, what we do in Cora up here in Canada, SCORA manages all of their races in their race series. So when you're, when you're racing in a Southern California race, um, you're registering on the SCORA website, you're signing a, an online waiver on the SCORA website, you know, and you're paying your fees to SCORA. You're not paying your fees to the host club or, or are you not signing a waiver that's specific to that particular race? You're signing one waiver that covers you for the entire series of SCORA races. So that's actually pretty convenient. Um, SCORA um, sets up their races in two different, at least two different series. I'm not sure about small boats, but they have, they, they run their iron series, um, sort of April, May, June, that culminates in the US Iron Champs, which is the race in San Diego in about mid June. And then after June, they run all their, their uh, what they call their six man change race uh, series. And um, that culminates in their US uh, championships. It's US, it would be the US Chains Championships which is the Catalina Crossing race, uh, which is uh, Newport Beach to Catalina Island or, or vice versa or back the other way. Uh, so I'll speak to, to both of those races, the US Iron Champs in San Diego and uh, the Catalina Crossing race uh, from Newport Beach, Catalina Island. So um, the, the San Diego US Iron Champs, it's a great race to do as a weekend race uh, from British Columbia. Uh, I'm not sure if there are direct flights to San Diego. Uh, I think WestJet used to have some direct flights down there, but maybe not anymore. Uh, if you do go down, do not transfer at LAX because that is a nasty airport to transfer at. Transfer someplace else um, like Seattle, but do not transfer in San Francisco either because you get fogged in and your flight may be delayed. So transfer someplace other than LAX or San Francisco. Anyway, so... Um, uh, the, uh, for the U.S. Iron Champs, they do not provide you with boats, um, so you will need to source out a boat from a, uh, another club down there. The host club is Kailua Outrigger Canoe Club. It's uh, based in San Diego on Mission Bay, and the, the couple of times that I've raced 
uh, we, we borrowed the boat from them. So that was pretty good. Um, you go down, fly down on say the Friday, meet up with, uh, the, with Kailua. So, you know, you help them move boats over uh, to the race site, paddle them over, and you can figure out which boat you're actually going to be uh, using during a race. You can maybe prep it that, that night. Nice to do stuff the day before. Um, the race is on the Saturday. They run it so that they have the Kekis first, then the novice course, and then women are next, and then the men. They run a uh, triangular course um, that starts outside of Mission Bay on the ocean, and they uh, set up a couple of buoys based on the conditions so that you go out, then down the coast, and then back in. Uh, the back in part of it is typically a surfing leg, and that's where all the locals zoom past you big time because uh, they're used to surfing on the ocean waves and like you know coming from bc is like yeah whatever <laughs> you know you can't keep up with them um one cool thing about it is that um they uh they marshal all the boats in mission bay uh there's, there's uh, the race sites at this park with nice sandy beaches and a little lagoon uh they marshal all the uh the canoes in uh, Mission Bay, and they all head out through the navigation channel to the ocean at the same time. So you've got this massive herd of boats um, moving out all at the same time. And if you put a Canadian flag on the back of your boat, like you normally do for away races, you know everyone's everyone's kind of cheering for you, and kind of makes you feel feel good. There's a bit of Ohana going on and that sort of thing. So you're heading out to the start line. Um, the the couple of times I uh, the last time I raced it was with mixed. Um, for the mixed race, uh, they start the uh, the women and the mixed uh, 20 minutes apart. And within each of those, they uh, they start the specs and the unlimiteds uh, a few minutes apart each. They start the specs off first, and then they they uh, set off the unlimiteds afterwards. Um, uh, one thing is that uh, the race course, it's supposed to be like 12 miles or something, but there was one year that we did it. Uh, there was a big jam up on the highway and so a, a ton of canoes didn't make it to the race site in time so they delayed the uh the women's mixed race and uh we gps did at 12k <laughs> so uh, it was a uh, a really short little race because they uh, didn't have time for it but uh there's a few turns in there because uh, it's triangular course you come back into mission bay and there's a uh, a left hand 90 degree turn uh so the kind of cool thing is, is that um, there's so many, so many ultralights down there that, um, you know, you're at the turns, they're, they're coming up passing you because they started, you know, a couple of minutes behind you and you're at the turns. And uh, one thing to remember on those courses, uh, those ultralights do not turn sharply. So if you're in a spec boat, which you probably will be borrowing a spec boat, uh, stay in the inside, do your sharp little turn. Uh, don't get pushed out by them on the turns. Um, so, uh, yeah, and uh, it's a it's a great little site there. They got on the on the beach. They've got a lot of vendors. They uh, for the uh, the they at the end of the day they've got you know they got a beer garden and they've got this novice dance competition, which is always really entertaining to watch at the at the San Diego race. Um, so that that's a good one. Good weekend trip feels like you're just going away to uh, another race somewhere, you know, in Canada and BC and in the interior or something, but you're just jumping on a plane, racing for a day and coming back up. Um, the other race that I'll talk about is Catalina Crossing. Uh, it's a change race. Um, so it's actually a lot more involved uh, to organize. Um, the, the way it's organized is that the women and the open mixed race from Newport Beach, California, which is in Orange County, just south of LA, over to Avalon on Catalina Island. That's on the Saturday. And then on the Sunday, the men race back. Uh, the men and the senior mixed race back. Um, there's a, a bit of a stagger between the starts, uh, 20 minutes or 10 minutes or something like that. Uh, for the women and the open mixed heading to Catalina Island, the race start is on the ocean outside of Newport Harbor, um, simply because the confines of Newport Harbor don't allow them to have a start line, um, you know, in, in that area, in the marina. Uh, it's about the similar dimensions as Falls Creek in Vancouver or the Gorge in Victoria. So, you know, you can't have 50 boats on a start line out there. So they started out in the ocean. 
Um, on the way back for the men and the senior mixed, uh, they start just outside of Avalon Harbor, a place called Lover's Cove, uh, and they come all the way in through Newport Harbor to um, uh, Newport Dunes, which is uh, the race site. And that's because by the time that the, the race, uh, you get to the end of the race, the, 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 um, the uh, boats have whittled down so that they're you know, few and far between so they can navigate their way through Newport Harbor. Um, they advertise the race course as being 42K, 25, 26 miles, 42K. But uh, when we did it in 2019, and, and I've done it before too, I've done it like four times, uh, two each way. And we GPSed it at 52 kilometers. And that's why it took us five hours instead of four hours. So don't be, don't be um, uh, really, you know, uh, um, disenchanted or, or just disappointed when you, you get to the four hour mark and you still can't see Catalina Island off in the distance. Like, where is it? Because uh, because it's actually something like 52K. And then for the man on the way back, because you go to the harbor, it's more like 57K. Um, the other thing too is, is that uh, because the, the race site is well within the harbor, uh, for the women and the open mix, it takes about half an hour to get to the start line. So you have to paddle 5K through Newport Harbor to get to the start line. So uh, the women starts like an 8 a.m. start. The men, the men start going the other way. It's a more civilized 10 a.m. start. Uh, that's probably because of the partying and that on Saturday night. But, um, you know, you got to get out there to the start line really early. Um, so uh, the, the race sites, are play, at New, on, Newport, on the Newport side, race sites at a place called Newport Dunes, the steers meeting, the skippers meeting, that's your escort boat driver, that's on Friday night, about six o'clock or so. So whether you're doing the Saturday race or the Sunday race, um, your change manager, your captain, your, 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 your crew organizer people need to be at Newport Dunes on Friday night. So that's one thing you gotta set up uh, in terms of people flying into town. You gotta be there for Friday night. And uh, you're, if you're, when you're borrowing the boat too, it's also good to be there Friday afternoon to help unload boats from the trailers, help rig the boats and that sort of stuff. The one very, very cool thing about the Catalina Crossing Race is that because of the number of crews entered and the logistics of matching up crews going to Catalina with crews coming back from Catalina, is that Scora assigns you a canoe. You do not need to find your own canoe and that the cost of that canoe is included in your race fee. The race fee is about 500 bucks or 550 bucks. The other very, very cool thing is that Southern California is awash in ultralight canoes. They want to assign you an ultralight canoe, but you can ask for an ultralight, you should ask for an ultralight canoe, a Malolo, the gunnel's the same height as a Mirage, you can climb in really easily. It's, uh, you know, we, we, we had a Malolo in 2018, changed into it for the first time ever, um during the race <laughs> you know never climbed into that before and it's like wow i got in this is very cool um but um in 2019 raced with a crew that wanted a spec boat and we raced open mixed in spec there were only two entries in spec that shows you how nobody wants to race a spec at the catalina crossing race you get an ultralight uh, you know, even if you've never done a change race in an ultralight, take or never steered it before, I'd never steered an ultralight, I'd paddled in an ultralight at the gorge, but I'd never steered an ultralight, I was the first time steering it, didn't even get the practice, it steered just like a mirage, it was easy as anything. So, you know, um, you know, if you've got any hesitations about it, grab an ultralight, it's, it, it's, it all, it's a, makes for a much, much better race than the spec boats. Um, so uh, steers meeting, uh, skippers meetings, Friday night. Um, if, you're, if, you're, if you're doing the men's race, typically you'd catch the ferry over to Catalina Island on Saturday morning. Uh, if you're doing the men's race, you should probably focus your base in around Newport Beach um, because you'll have to have people at the skippers meeting catch the Catalina Flyer from Balboa Pier, Catal uh, Newport, 
and that goes over. You'll probably see some of the women in Nick's boats uh, when you're going over uh, on the ferry. Uh, and then you race back and you race back to Newport Beach. So if you're staying at a hotel in around the Newport Beach area, you know, you're, you're leaving from there and you're coming back from there. If you're running, if you're running the mixed race or the women's race, uh, you probably got a bit more options. Um, one thing um, is that, uh, you know, you're, you're going from Newport Beach paddling over and then you make your way back and um, you can either come back to Newport Beach on the, on the Catalina Flyer or you can take the Catalina Express. There are two different ferry companies that go to Catalina. One's a flyer, which goes to Newport Beach. The Express is the other one. It goes to Long Beach. And um, what we did in 2019, in 2019 was that we stayed over two nights, uh, Saturday night and Sunday night in Avalon on Catalina Island. And then we came back uh, on the Express and we went to Long Beach instead of back to Newport Beach. And then we took Ubers right to the airport, right? So we spent our time on Catalina Island. And some of the hotels on Catalina Island will require a two night stay. So that, you know, you gotta factor those things in as well. Um, so if you're, if you're going for the men's race, uh, you know, hopefully you can find a place that'll allow you have, to have a one night stay because, you know, someone's gotta be in Newport on a Friday night. So that means Friday night, you're staying over in Newport and then Saturday night, you're staying over in Avalon, then racing back on Sunday, right? So that's really only one night on the island. Whereas if you're running the women's or the mixed race, you know, if you don't come back on the Saturday night after the race, you can stay over for a couple of nights, have a nice, nice long weekend over there. And then uh, take the ferry back and hightail it right to the airport, right? You don't need to stay back in Orange County at all. A um, couple other things is that um, in terms of uh, luau, they only have a luau on the Sunday night after the men's race. They do not have a luau on the Catalina side. They have an awards ceremony, but they don't have a luau there. Um, so, you know, I, I, they do arrange a ferry that comes back on the Saturday called the Wahine Express. But it depends. It's nice to spend time on Catalina, right? So, so it, it takes a lot of uh, organization. Um, the other thing too is, is that if you've got rental cars that are uh, in Newport Beach, you got to find some place to store the rental cars uh, while you're on the island. Like find some place to park it at your hotel. Maybe the hotel can store your luggage or something too, or find a place uh, on the street where you can park. Uh, like at Newport Dunes on the Back Bay Drive, you might be able to park it there. I think we did that one year, because um, then. Like, the men's race you're coming back right to that area so you just walk back to the car um, but um, a lot of good logistics in terms of conditions i've done it four times 2009 2012 18 and 19 never been big just been nice swells um, maybe some chop but uh, it's a fantastic race for uh, anyone who's never done an ocean change race the biggest thing is that you learn whether you get seasick on the escort boat on the ocean, because those big swells, it's a lot different than doing a change race on a lake, like whether it's Lake Washington, Okanagan Lake, or Sprout Lake around British Columbia, that sort of stuff. Um, being on the ocean is totally different. I have the scopolamine patch that I put on, and that takes care of it. Get a bit of dry mouth, cotton mouth, but you need that. You, you know, you figure out you need that after your first race when. Uh, you get to the ship's rail to jump into the water for your change and you just start puking your guts out onto the person who's in the water <laughs> who already jumped in. <laughs> and, uh, and then you just miss that change and you know that your, your, your seat partner uh, has to stay in the canoe for that extra, extra shift and uh, they get kind of pissed off about that. So. Uh, <laughs> but, the uh, patch, Ron? Somebody's asking what that patch was called. Could you repeat uh, that? Okay. Um, it's uh it's called uh transderm v is the um is the brand name and the uh, the drug is scopolamine which is um it's it's a psychotic it's not an antipsychotic it's a psychotic <laughs> um it's it's uh yeah it's made from some uh, some kind of a uh of a 
poisonous plant or something. Um, but anyways, it just sits right behind your ear and uh, you put it on the night before and uh, you're good to go and you do not get seasick. You get a little bit of dry mouth. You should try it out ahead of time locally or whatnot for a race to see if, you know, that dry mouth really bugs you too, too much. But, um, you know, the other things are, is, you know, people eat uh, ginger chews or take uh, gravel and that sort of stuff. But I find that the patch works really well. Um, but Catalina Crossing, it's, it's a fantastic race. If it's your first, uh, you know, it's a first change race on the ocean, that's a really good one because um, it's, the conditions are really, uh, they're, they're uh, like easy going kind of conditions in my, in my view anyways, yeah. And um, it's kind of cool, like uh, Jeannie was talking about not being able to see Alcatraz. Well, when you're racing towards Catalina, you can't see the island. And then you can't see the island until you get pretty close to it because it, it's kind of shrouded in, in fog or, or uh, mist. And when you see the island, that's like, ah, there it is. So that's pretty cool. And uh, one year coming back, we had dolphins surround the canoe. So that was really cool too. Ron, just a quick question because we're yeah. running out of time. I'm, you, you said that SCORE organizes getting you the canoe, but who organizes getting you a chase boat? Actually, yeah, that's right. I forgot to mention that. SCORE does uh, arrange to get you a chase boat as well. It is not included in the race fee. Uh, it's like an additional $500, and you pay that to your skipper, your escort driver, uh, directly. So you can pay that to, to that guy um, either at the skippers meeting on the Friday night or uh, on the boat on race day. And um, you would you would probably load up your escort boat at um, Newport Dunes. There's a boat ramp there. It's right next to the race site. Uh, you got to get there really, really early. Um, and that's for the uh, the race to the island. Um, for the, because the starts at 8 a.m. So you got to get there like 5 a.m. or 6 a.m. or something to load your boat because everybody else is trying to load their boat too. On the way back, there's a pier in Avalon Harbor called the Green Pier. And there's a limited number of moorings around there. And that's where uh, you can load your escort boat there too. Um, oh, another thing is, is that um, with the canoes, um, if you're there helping unload your, if you're heading to the island, from Newport Dunes, um, and you're helping your your boat, uh, cl the club loaning you your boat, uh, you might be able to practice in the canoe in the lagoon on the Friday if you're rigging it. Um, if you're heading from Catalina Island in the men's race on the Sunday, no, you will not get a chance to uh, practice in your canoe at all. Uh, what happens is that the, uh, the canoes go over to uh, the Catalina and they're immediately put onto moorings, uh, tethered together. They're stacked up on one another uh, on the water, uh, and that's where they're stored overnight. And so that's another reason why it's useful to meet up with the club loaning you the canoe, so you can identify the canoe uh, on the Friday. So you you know take a picture of the canoe. You know what the number is. You, well, you put your you put your boat numbers on on the Friday. Um, but you, you know, find out what color it is because a lot of canoes look alike. They're all ultralights and they're all very colorful, fantastic looking canoes. Um, but then you got this stack of two stacks actually of like 50 canoes or 25, 30, 40 canoes on each stack. And you got to find your canoe. So if you're in the men's race on Sunday at the end of the day on Saturday, um, once all the women's crews and mixed crews are in, you know, go down, figure out where your canoe is. Uh, and then the Sunday morning, you know, you have to have someone swim out, untether your canoe, and then they, they swim the canoe back to the beach. And then that's when you rig it and prep it. And then you're good to go to the start line. And you only, and on the Sunday morning, you won't even see uh, any reps from the club loaning you the canoe. You just grab your canoe and, uh, and go, right? So you, you won't see anybody. So you need to connect with them on the Friday before, uh, before the skipper's meeting. So, okay, well, uh, you're just like a bundle of information, Ron. Yeah, no, that's the Catalina race is, race is a good race, actually. Oh, yeah, it's so. very, you were very thrilled. Yeah, I'm dying, I'm dying to do Catalina. I haven't done it. I was supposed to do it in 2019 and I couldn't because of an injury. So my, my teammates went without me. 
Um, and, anyway, and, and you get a free ultralight. <laughs> well, nothing's free. Um, well, the, the race fee is pretty, you know, it's reasonable. You know, yeah, it's it's totally reasonable. It's like 500 bucks or 550 or something like that. Yeah. Because like for a Hawaiian, for a Hawaiian uh, uh, canoe rental, they're borrowing a canoe from a club in Hawaii. Like the boat fee itself is like five or 600 bucks, yeah. you know. So, yeah. Okay. So sadly, Ron, uh, you, you now have the task of wrapping it up. Oh, okay. Thanks, everybody. Um, <laughs> and I believe that uh, this is the, is it the last, is it the, oh, no, I think, I think we still got another, another week of the uh, virtual race number two um, going on, um, hosted by uh, Fraser Valley. Is it? No, uh, just no, to clarify, no. that, that race uh, ends and today. Yeah. Today ends today. Oh, okay. All right. So look for the uh, third ra uh, virtual race uh, in June then coming up. Um, and then we've got two more virtual t uh, virtual uh, set, uh, town halls uh, planned uh, in June, I believe. Right, Leanne? We are doing this, right? And it's going to be everything to do with OC1. So there'll be a coaching, a coaching uh, clinic where you'll probably have a lot of people arguing with each other <laughs> on technique. <laughs> and then we've got uh, another town hall just to uh, uh, people can uh, discuss their experiences uh, and whatnot, just to it'll, it'll be more of a uh, open, sort of a, a free forum type of thing where people can discuss uh, anything OC1 that they want to talk about, whether it's like models of boats and and um, tra uh, haul hauling votes to race uh, to races and all that kind of stuff. And okay. Ron, we haven't uh, talked about this as a committee, but we might actually add another coaches thing into the beginning of July just to talk about sprints and what Canada is going to do for uh, sprints in London right. and such as well. So that may be coming down the pipe too, but everything will be put out in print, you know, this week. Okay. And uh, Rob Magus from False Creek wants to make a plug for False Creek because uh false creek is trying to get uh, a number of crews going to the nepali race on Kauai, um in hawaii on uh, in 2022 and we're making uh, uh plans really well in advance he's put his email in the chat rob magus at hotmail.com they're having we're having a zoom meeting at 7 p.m tonight if you're interested that one's a change race around the uh the uh, I guess it's the west side of uh, Kauai. It's a it's a uh, a six man crew changing out with a six woman crew, and um, so it's a full a full boat change race. So that's an interesting one. So um, email Rob if you're interested on that. Okay. So uh, thanks everybody for joining us, and. Um, Hopefully we'll see you next month again. Hopefully uh, people won't be, uh, you know, uh, leaving us to be on the water, like paddle in the morning, visit us in the afternoon, you know. <laughs> Thanks everybody.